Just before the Napoleonic era of Europe, Prussia and Austria had been feuding as the dominant powers of the Holy Roman Empire. Although their rivalry did not die, the Holy Roman Empire sure did, as Napoleon captured Vienna and put an end to the centuries-old institution. There was really only one time where Prussia and Austria worked together on the post-Napoleonic stage, and that was the Schleswig-Holstein War, where the two German powers fought Denmark to free Schleswig and Holstein from Danish control. The Prussians and Austrians won, which might make you think they felt friendlier towards each other. In reality, feelings were anything but friendly, with the balance of power shifting towards Prussia as a German unifier. When Otto von Bismarck allied with Italy after disagreement over joint sovereignty in Schleswig-Holstein, progressively larger mobilizations of battalions across Austria, Italy, and Prussia began until war broke out on June 14th, and Prussian forces invaded various Austrian-aligned duchies, and engaged in a heated battle with Austria itself, mostly in Bohemia. In Victoria III, a lot of the tensions and details of the German unification aren't particularly important, the Prussian-Austrian rivalries are presented as exactly that in the game, a rivalry, one which, with the click of a button, can be ended. This begs the question, what would Germany be like if Prussia had mended its issues with Austria and rather than dividing the German confederation between the two, created one massive super-Germany? Let's solve the Schleswig-Holstein question and make amends with Austria so we can become the Germany that our people deserve. Dropping in as Prussia, we're in a pretty unique diplomatic position with the German Confederation forming a shared market that encompasses everyone except Austria and Hanover. We immediately need to build up the country's industry using the resources all these customs members provide us. I'm going to use Silesia as my source of coal and iron given its massive population and abundance of both precious materials. Over in Westphalia and the Rhineland, I'm going to get lots of steel, explosives, and ammunition going. Diplomatically speaking, I'm going to bankroll Hanover and all the smaller German nations in its customs union. Soon, the King of England will die, and Hanover will go free. We have to put the newly independent kingdom into our market so we can assure their allegiance to the German cause. I'm going to improve relations with Britain and Russia too, rivaling France to get the extra influence I need for all this diplomacy. I didn't do it for a little while because, well, I forgot, even though it's the main strategy of this run, nice job me, but you also want to end the rivalry with Austria and begin improving relations. This might require you to stop improving relations with some of the German minor powers, but it's worth it for Super Germany. From here, it's mostly just building up a little bit and getting a strong economy going while we wait for the Germans to research nationalism. We don't get access to the journal entries we need until nationalism comes in. We could go for Schleswig-Holstein right now, but I'm waiting to get a stronger economy first and to improve relations with more great powers so we can get away with it more easily. I got Hanover into my union in 1838 by absolving an obligation that I got from bankrolling and then promising an obligation to them. The rest of the independent German states came under my control over time. I'm passing cultural exclusion because, as a European, getting access to a ton of non-discriminated pops will be useful for inviting agitators and for keeping radicals low as we expand the empire in the future. After researching nationalism, I went to the military tab to queue up everything I'd need for shrapnel artillery. The shrapnel artillery tech gives you the edge you need to beat anyone in Europe if you can get it fast enough. We can't really take on Austria or France or anyone really in our current state, even though we might feel strong. It's not until we unite North Germany and get access to this new artillery that we'll really have the advantage militarily. In terms of buildings, I'm making lots of iron, coal, tools, and steel, as well as just a couple shipyards in West Prussia. I don't need a navy right now, but I might as well get just a few man of wars going for invading Denmark later. I was a bit apprehensive at first about invading Denmark, since I wasn't sure where Britain and France would stand, but France was feeling conciliatory and Britain had interests elsewhere keeping them busy. This is when I decided to make my move on Denmark. There's an extremely important note I need to make abundantly clear about this journal entry, which is not immediately very intuitive. The journal requires that no non-German nation control Schleswig-Holstein. The nation of Schleswig is both North German and Danish, which means even though you might think they're a German nation, their existence prevents this journal from completing. It's also the case that you as Prussia must hold only a portion of the state and not the whole thing. The only way to actually complete this journal entry is to conquer Schleswig directly and to liberate Holstein. Doing it any other way will break the journal entry. Okay, with that clear, let's declare the war and see how things go. According to the sway section of the diplomatic incident, Britain and Austria may join against me, which, if that were to happen, would basically be an immediate reset. Let's see how things go. I made both my war goals primary war goals so I could get both of them in case Denmark backs down, which would be optimal. We ventured into the diplomatic maneuvers phase and Britain immediately joined Denmark. No big deal, because that means I can get France. I offered them an obligation. When France joined, Austria then supported Denmark, but no big deal, that means I can get Russia. I offered them a humiliation on Austria. I have basically started World War I over this small territorial issue in Schleswig-Holstein, which I think is kind of funny, although because of Victoria III having no great war systems, the consequences of this massive war between the great powers is basically nothing. 
Either Denmark loses Schleswig Holstein and Austria is humiliated, or I pay Denmark money. Really earth shattering stakes. Let's up the ante a little bit. I have just enough maneuvers to demand Austria relinquish their German leadership candidacy. This is perfect as I can solve the Danish problem and get Austria out of the running simultaneously. I loaded up my units in Silesia, hoping that my combined power with Russia will let me win. France, as support, should make the war pretty easy since they'll distract Britain. I'm a little worried about being able to actually land in Denmark since I have no land connections to them, but I'm pretty sure with how fleets work in this game I'll just magically make it into Copenhagen. The war broke out on June 15th of 1841 and I immediately sent a fleet to Copenhagen, increased soldier wages, and watched in anticipation to see if I would get the victories I'd need for this pretty amazing start to the run. As expected, I did land in Denmark's capital without any resistance because no fleets were in the area even though Britain's fleet is absolutely massive. I secured the capital and Schleswig itself and then sent the army to be defensive and just wait for French troops to shore the front line up until Denmark gives in. Russia, meanwhile, was losing ground to Austria, but I made massive ground through Bohemia as I was on the outskirts of Vienna itself. Austria didn't dedicate enough troops to defend against me, most likely because they were committing troops to the Russian front. With one more decisive win in Bohemia, I occupied Vienna, and now I know this war will end very soon. Denmark capitulated in March, and this left the entire French, Russian, and Prussian army available to occupy Austria, while Britain just kinda watched. So one month later, Austria signed a peace deal relinquishing their leadership and letting Russia claim the victory over them. Immediately upon signing the deal, the North German Federation was proclaimed, and I'm feeling pretty powerful here in 1842. From here, you actually can just immediately click the Form Germany button if you want to, but that would be kinda lame. It would be historical, but not as fun as a proper Super Germany. We need to get Austria to support us as the unification candidate, and all that'll take is time. If we keep improving relations, we can get to neutral, and eventually even bankroll Austria. We'll do whatever we can to get relations up, and in the meantime, we can free Luxembourg and work on our economy. Despite Russia and I having recently worked together against Austria, they backed the Netherlands against me. This gives me the opportunity to free Poland and get reparations from Russia. The reparations will be useful for bankrolling Austria, which will create a very strange relationship between the three powers. Russia, having humiliated Austria, will also be paying them through the intermediary of Prussia, who inflicted a crushing defeat on their enemy Austria, but who now needs their support or something. I don't know. 19th century diplomacy is confusing. I'm not sure why, but France joined the war on my side for no reason. Maybe they want the Netherlands market open for some reason? I'm not sure, but I welcome the help of course, and this pretty much guarantees my victory. The war broke out with me demanding the Netherlands free Luxembourg and open their market, and that Russia released Poland as discussed before. Shortly after, France offered a trade agreement which continues the pattern of a strange amicability between the Franks and their natural enemy, Prussia. I mean, I'll take it for now, since France is not an enemy I want for the moment, but it still kind of weirds me out. In the west, the Netherlands are completely disintegrating to my army, but Russia is actually holding out pretty well. I'm going for a mini Schlieffen plan here, with my plan to knock out the Netherlands, then to turn around and march east against Russia. This strategy so far has been working great, and although the war support doesn't look good for me, I've turned the tables on Russia and I should be able to win. It was in January of 1844 that Russia surrendered. I immediately looked to befriend Poland so I can turn them into a protectorate and eventually a puppet. I'm also going to bankroll Austria using that Russian money. The first big step towards friendship with Austria was a renewed trade agreement. With a trade agreement, bankrolling, and improving relations, I should be able to get their support relatively soon. I'm also trying to befriend Luxembourg, although they don't like me much, and I'm not sure I'll wait until they agree to join my nation to properly form it. I'd rather just conquer them later. Anyway, with all the money and diplomacy I'm pumping into Austria, they supported my claim to form Germany in 1847, and thus I hit the form Germany button with everyone except Luxembourg supporting me. That's fine. There she is. Super Germany and all her glory. I've got a cool 70 million GDP and a horrifically dying budget which I need to fix. I recommend just destroying some barracks to keep yourself out of heavy debt, although later on I ended up destroying some construction sectors. It's always difficult to rebalance the economy when you inherit the massive Austrian Empire, which the AI likely wasn't running very well. So what should we do now with Super Germany? It's not always easy to know what to do in Victoria 3, but I can tell you this. There's an achievement for playing as Germany and getting states in Africa, so it looks like we'll be founding Middle Africa. And perhaps doing some dismantling of great powers. I'm building up a ton of universities so I can get to malaria prevention as soon as possible. Beyond that, I'm getting railways down everywhere and getting that sweet silk from Venice going so I can make more luxury clothes. My first military targets are in Scandinavia with our first foe of Denmark coming into the German lens. This is mostly because Denmark has lands in Africa that we can use to expand our own natural interests. As an actual puppet, Denmark won't be all that useful, but any bit of income we can get is good. France joined on Denmark's side, finally showing their true colors as not my actual friend. I'm going to do my best to put France in their place, since France is honestly quite powerful and I don't want them bothering me later. 
I'm going to liberate Occitania, since that tends to cripple France, and I'm going to get war operations, since my budget kinda sucks these days. With how powerful Super Germany is, I could take on France and Denmark easily. I immediately pushed into both Alsace-Lorraine and Copenhagen without any issues, although pushing all the way to Paris might take some time. For that reason, I sent some naval invasions out to Normandy and Picardy. After Denmark backed down, there were no war goals against me, which meant my war exhaustion could go below zero. That was a little scary given that the front to Paris was going quite slowly, but I did manage to reach Paris and free the Occitans. France isn't completely neutered from that, but it will definitely weaken them. I made Poland a protectorate right after, which will let me puppet them for very cheap later. Oh, and France immediately offered a defensive pact if I defeated them. Yeah, I bet you'd like that, wouldn't you, France? I'm working on passing colonial exploitation, so I just want to extract raw materials from Africa more so than settle it. I'm also going to puppet Sweden, since it comes with the free additional country of Norway. Sweden backed down, which was nice of them, and I went for a puppet play on my new personal union of Norway. Norway did not back down, but they lost the war pretty quickly as they had no support. I got a little ballsy at this point and went to puppet the Netherlands. Their control over much of Indonesia will be really useful to me as a temporary source of dyes. I'm going to secure my own later in Africa, but the temporary source will be great. Russia joined the war, which means I get another opportunity to cut them down. I'm going to make Russia release Ukraine, and I'll be opening their market just to spite them. It might not seem like much, but forcing a market open on a country means no more tariffs, and it gives them less control over their economy, not that the AI really does much to control its economy to begin with. Suddenly enough, Luxembourg joined the war, so I spent a measly 3 infamy to take them too. Similarly to last time, Russia managed to push into Prussia at first, but my sleeping plan would most likely come through as usual. I'm not sure why Russia has been so competent these days, but it'll only slow down my victory slightly. I sent a naval invasion to St. Petersburg, which landed successfully, and now I've just gotta defend the front there until I win. The war ended in March of 1852, with both the Netherlands and Russia surrendering simultaneously. I also annexed Krakow at this point, since they are just sort of a waste of space. After that, I focus back on my economy. My infamy is kind of high and I want to colonize, so I'll need a navy and industries to put their materials from Africa into. Why exploit Africa if we're not putting the plunder to good use? I'm also going to put a ton of farms down over in Austria and Hungary because I want to cheapen up grain and generate a ton of loyalists. Since I'm at peace and I've got the budget rebalanced, I want to get a politically stable country with a huge loyalist count, and I also want to make any states I conquer become loyal quickly on account of the cheap grain. Most of the time when you conquer a state, it'll have enough radicals to trigger a secession, but if you have cheap consumer goods, then they should pretty quickly increase standard of living until the radicals go away. I'm also putting in wealth voting because I want to start getting some power out of the Junkers hands and into the industrialists, intelligentsia, and trade unions where I can. Those interest groups are, in general, just better than the landowners. For my first wars in Africa, I'll be invading Zulu and the Boer states. These states have tons of gold, coal, and iron, although I'm here for the gold mostly. I barely have the infamy cap to attack these guys, but gold is gold and I'm here for it. It can be frustrating to invade Zulu when Oranje or Transvaal join because they end up creating a silly second front that can keep kicking you out of Zululand, but it is what it is. Keep naval invading until you win. Maybe in the next patch, they'll fix some of these ridiculous front systems. The Transvaal Boers and the Zulu surrendered and I got my first taste of conquest in Africa. Meanwhile, my colonies in Cameroon are growing extremely quickly because of my massive incorporated population. Colonization is easier the bigger your country is, specifically the bigger its incorporated population. And for that reason, we can actually start colonizing even in severe malaria states because even with the minus 95% growth, we still get a province every couple months. That will quickly accelerate once we get malaria prevention. I'm not doing that quite yet since I still have regular malaria states to colonize, but once those are done, I'll get working on Namibia and the Congo. I went for a puppet play on Poland and Ukraine joined on their side. I'm not going to do much to Ukraine just because I have no interest in them really, I just need them to not be with Russia so they get weaker. After that simple war, I sent one of my admirals, Ignaz von dem Knisbeck, off to explore the Niger River. I've never done these buttons before because I have no idea what they do and I want to see. I've just never felt the desire to click these exploration buttons. The only explorations I ever do are the American Western Frontier as America for the Oregon Treaty. In 1861, I completed the expedition and got a hefty 25% prestige bonus, but it doesn't matter because I'm already number one great power by a huge margin. Let's do the Congo River too. I'll send out Ignatz for this one too. Turns out the Congo River gives the same modifier, but they do stack, so maybe if you're a fledgling power looking to sneak into great power status, these could be useful. But beyond that, I see no reason to ever explore these rivers. They should give claims to states in the Congo or Nigeria or something so other powers can't colonize there. And that way, exploring the rivers becomes an important competition for powers to get their colonial claims. But that's just my opinion. I went for the last river, the Nile. But it failed and I don't want to waste more time on rivers, so I stopped there. In more important news, I'm working on getting commercial agriculture, and this is for two reasons. First off, I want to reduce the power of my landowners even more, and I want my massive farms to generate capitalists who will invest in the investment pool more than aristocrats would. 
Keep in mind that commercial agriculture doesn't completely remove aristocrats from farms. It just tacks on extra capitalist jobs, how publicly traded did to farms in older patches. Despite having a pretty high chance to pass, in the last stage of the law, I just kept on failing debates, and eventually the law got thrown out because the law system is great. Sorry, I'm complaining again. I do like this game, okay? Just some things where you want to pull my hair out. Before that happened though, Britain had a civil war, and I just want to sow chaos in the world, so I'm going to help the rebels win. They are religious rebels, and they want agrarianism too, so I might actually seriously harm Britain by doing this. They are also massively in debt and owe me an obligation. Despite me having made them won the war, they are still immediately wary of me and probably will break all diplomatic connections within a short period of time. From here the colonies just kind of chug along and I focus again back on the economy. Let me explain a bit about how I decide what to build. You see, it's quite simple. Just check the market tab and sort by the relative price. Wherever you see yellow coins in a stack, build that up. And wherever there are brown coins, either build industries that use that good or export. Exporting can be good if the AI is able to consume the goods, but in the current patch, most of the AI is just going to bankrupt over and over again, so they don't tend to have particularly strong economies, unfortunately. Export economies don't go over well these days, so you've got to live in a perfect autarky. I annexed Poland in 1872, and Britain, who I just fought to make exist, sided against me, of course. I then decided to free Ireland, liberate the Raj, and Hyderabad. With my massive navy and army against a bankrupt death cycle Britain, I easily landed in London, but I forgot they moved their capital to the Midlands because of the war, so I was in the wrong state the whole time. This one is my fault. In 1874, they surrendered, creating a free India, Ireland, and Hyderabad, alongside money for me and a free trading Britain. Since I'm kind of on a war spree, I'm going to go break down America too. Canada is helping them so I can break them down as well. I'm going to free New Africa, the Métis, and New England, alongside reparations and a humiliation. Now look, I can keep covering these wars, but we all know how it'll go. A naval invade, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, then I hold out in the capital until I win. The Americans and Canadians surrendered in 1877, and this will heavily affect America since the South is pretty important for their economy. I attacked Russia again to liberate Belarus and Lithuania since I want to create a buffer zone. I don't want Russia to have access to my eastern side anymore, and I think it'll keep the peace between us, hopefully. Over time, you'll probably notice how my standard of living is growing very quickly, and this is on account of just creating jobs. I'm building lots of steel mills, railways, chemical plants, textile mills, whatever, just anywhere that has unemployed or peasant pops. The fastest way to raise standard of living might seem like it would have to do with the price of goods, and it does, but more so it's about the creation of jobs. Where every pop is employed, there will be no poverty. Anyway, war with Russia ended in 1878, and I've got a very aesthetic looking German empire if you ask me. It just sort of squarely fits into Europe so nicely. Might as well add Belgium to the collection, I guess. I've got a claim on Wallonia anyway because of Luxembourg sharing a state with it. It was shortly after the conquest of Belgium that I began the construction of power plants across the country. Well, not really across it, more just concentrated in particular states for that sweet economy of scale bonus. At the beginning of 1881, my GDP is 568 million, and we'll be doubling that pretty fast without much, if any, conquest, all thanks to electricity. The reason electricity is so good is that it unlocks so many extremely good production methods and in particular, it allows you to create a self-sustaining supply chain loop with several pieces in it. Once you unlock electric arc process for steel mills, electric engines and electric railways, you can create railways that run electricity and engines, and engines that run electricity and steel are produced with electricity. The engines you make are used in the power plants to make more steel and more engines and to power the railways. The railways provide transportation for the urban centers that your power plants make, and the urban centers use electricity for services. The services are always in demand since pops always consume them, and as they get richer they only consume more. You're only limited in growing your economy at this point by your iron and coal, which are in theory limited resources, although there's plenty of it just in the German Empire's borders alone, let alone in all of Africa. Speaking of which, Africa is being colonized nicely. We got basically all of the best parts of Africa, and if I were willing to put in some work, I could easily fight France for more of West Africa, and I could grab Sokoto for huge coal and iron stores. By the way, I'm bankrolling all of the little nations I've released over time so I can make them into protectorates. It's the lazy man's conquest, but it's also super low infamy, so it does have utility. Why am I wanting infamy? Just to show off the strategy. It could be possible in your games that you want to take on a subject but not risk a diplomatic play or huge infamy. Consider protectorates then. I could easily break the infamy cap, which I will in a little while, and just go wild and no one could defeat me right now, especially since everyone is bankrupting constantly. It was in 1888 that I unlocked electric engines and just watched the GDP rise from changing over to electricity. With coal-fired plants and electric engines turned on, I instantly jumped to 925 million GDP, with just a little more growth, albeit a billion pretty soon. This is just 7 years after my GDP was at 568 million, 
I've almost doubled my GDP in just 7 years by creating the electricity loop. It was at this point I broke the infamy cap, declared war on Bengal for North and South Bengal, and the Ottomans intervened. In the interest of pretty borders, I added Bosnia and Ottoman Montenegro to the war goals. I'm at 20.5 sarin living in 1889, and unfortunately it will go down once I conquer Bengal, but that's only because they'll need time to be elevated to the German sarin living. I even passed the multiculturalism where they didn't really need to, as I don't have that many pops which would be discriminated under cultural exclusion. Nonetheless, it's always nice to have no discrimination because migration targets will suddenly come constantly to my land. I jumped to 1 billion GDP right on January 1st of 1890 thanks to the conquest of Bengal, and then they immediately tried to secede. Bad luck for me. By the way, pro tip here, if you ever have a secession or native uprising, you can just force close the game and save scum it. Secessions and native uprisings, unlike most of the RNG in the game, are not seeded, so you can save scum them. Anyway, the Ottomans fell pretty fast, now the borders are truly beautiful. I researched new farming technology and got the max level farming fertilizers, which actually caused a shrink in my GDP. This is because the price of grain has dropped to almost nothing, which in real life would be a horrific thing as farmers immediately went out of business, but in this game it just means some people get fired as expenses are cut and grain remains cheap. Cheaper goods do shrink the GDP, but this is fine because I want my standard of living to get higher anyway. I started building some oil rigs in Hanover so I could make my chemical plants use the new fertilizer methods, and I didn't do much else in the game from here. I've sort of done everything I want, as I watch France collapse to the Paris Commune, and I undo the Canadian Confederation, splitting all the provinces into as many shards as I can. As a Canadian, it's a shame to see, but also, free Métis people is pretty based. I do wish the British Columbia could exist as anything besides Oregon, but it's fine. I invaded the new French communes, as apparently I could cut them down to size, but they had a revolution that invalidated my war partway through. I'm not sure what cutting them down to size would have done, since all they conquered was the old French monarchy. Anyway, this is Super Germany. We've been number one power for most of the game, and we shall remain there. We peaked at a standard living of 20.5, and although Germany proper is still growing, the acquisition of Bengal brought the average down to 18.6. Given enough time, the Indians will reach the German level too, but it'll take too long and I'm done with this campaign. Look at the sea of green in Germany here in 1894. Even Sweden and Norway are prospering under my market. As always, Victoria 3 grossly misrepresents the effects of colonialism in Africa, as the parts of Africa I rule are paradoxically some of the most prosperous places on Earth at this time. I'm pretty sure that's not how that's supposed to work. So that's Super Germany as Prussia. It's easier to do as Austria and requires less time, but it's just not as satisfying, I'd say. Not to mention it's not even very hard, it just requires some lateral thinking with the whole repairing relations with Austria and all. I got pretty lucky in this run early on with that opportunity to defeat Austria early, but beating Austria won't be that hard for most people, especially if you can ally Bavaria to get access to Vienna. I never did take Alsace Lorraine, which is a German homeland, but only because I was lazy, not because I couldn't. I hope you enjoyed this guide to forming Super Germany in Victoria 3. Let me know how it goes for you in the comments. Thank you for your time.